You're listening to Mid Morning Matters on Marlow FM 97.5. My next guest is Paul Burgess. Paul is a, a functional medis- medicine practitioner, I think. Paul, is that right? It is. And, and what exactly is a functional medicine practitioner? Well, uh, it's funny you should ask that because everybody else does. The, uh, a functional medicine practitioner is basically, if you think of a conventional doctor, they will look at a symptom and they'll give you a medication for it. What we do is we look at the cause of the symptom treat that and then what we can do is get not only long lasting improvements and change but none of the side effects that the medication will do so we look at um you know all sorts of different um contributors to to illness different symptoms that people have that kind of thing um it's a very interesting um area of science and uh i've been doing it for a long long time and um and and i love it very passionate about it all right. I mean, I've known you for several years. You've always been working in this particular field. Um, is, is there particularly an, an exercise bent to it as well? Because I know you're well known in the field of exercise as well. It's an interesting one. I think from, from an exercise training physical perspective, nowadays too many people are thinking that that's the answer to everything. Right. And they end up training too much. And when you put that much stress on an already compromised body yeah. that's not well from a health perspective, more training is actually going to be worse for you. Right. So we definitely include advice on training, but often it's to dial it back and, do, um, and be more specific about what you're doing rather than you know, a load of cardio or a load of HIIT training because that's what you've read in the, lo- the latest men's health or whatever it is yeah so yeah it's definitely a part of it but um normally it's the opposite of what people think right i guess a lot of what you have to do is to uh disabuse people of stuff they've read online or in magazines and what have you so i've just read that the best thing to do is dot 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 and the first thing you say is well yeah yet another person come to me with something they've read or something they've seen online and that now let me give you the real facts is that true yeah i mean <clears throat> here's the danger of the internet one of the dangers is that People read and then believe everything they read. And we actually, it's been really good the last couple of years um, since we've had a, an interesting gentleman in charge of the USA. <laughs> this, this, this notion of fake news has, has become more prevalent so people understand that actually maybe you should question what you're reading. And, and that goes to every industry. So whether it be fitness, health, whether it be cars, whether it be horses, whatever it is, you, you know, it's very easy to put something online with a a veneer of credibility and for people to believe it, even though potentially it's not true. So going to Dr. Google to find out what <laughs> your your uh, symptoms mean can be very destructive. And, you know, what we do is take away all the fluff around it and start working on exactly what people should be doing. Everyone's individual, so there's no point you doing the same as me or me doing the same as you because it's not going to... It's just not going to work for us. So from our perspective, it's looking at that individual and making sure that whatever their particular issues are, are addressed. My guest is Paul Burgess, functional medicine practitioner, and he's going to talk a little bit now, I think, about uh, some of the aspects of modern life and the effect that uh, that um, the environment in which we live in creates uh, problems for ourselves. Yes, and, and do you know what? The, very often we'll find um, patients come to us with weight issues, right? right? A lot of people nowadays are a little bit overweight, right? We see it all the time. Do you see both sides? Do you see underweight people as well? Yeah, you, you absolutely do. <clears throat> and I think that has also got, um, you know, is the end result of some vi- environmental issues. But the majority of people we're seeing now, and even young children, sadly, are a little bit overweight. Some of them are getting diabetic at a very young age. But when you look at the adult population, what we're seeing is... One of the causes, or one of the causati- causative factors, is poor sleep. Right. And a lot of people are suffering poor sleep nowadays. Um, and it's becoming more and more common that people can't get to sleep, or they can't stay asleep. They're very tired when they wake up, and yet, by the evening, they can't get to sleep again. So it's a really difficult way for people to live, and it goes on for years and years and years, and, you know... They, it, 
has so, a lot. So in, in summary, people are kind of sleepy when they really shouldn't be, and when they should be, they aren't. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? And um, well, well, interestingly, if you have sleep deprivation, yeah. the next day you have the same um, abilities uh, as, a, as someone who's over the drink drive limit. Right. right. So in other words, you assess situations and have the same reaction time as someone who's drunk too much and gets behind the wheel of a car. The challenge with that is we've got thousands of people every morning getting up sleep deprived, getting in a car yeah. and having the same ability as a drunk person. So it's a really you know important thing to start addressing. And the thing with poor sleep is the next day it makes you store more fat rather than burn more fat. So you actually become worse at processing your carbohydrate, which is your sugar, which turns to fat. Right? Hey, can you explain that a bit more detail? What, why is that the case? Well, because it reduces your insulin sensitivity. So you're, you're not using the hormone insulin to process or metabolise your uh, sugar properly and get it into your cells for burning as energy. So while it's not getting into the cells, it's floating around in the, in the blood, and while it's in the blood, it's going to get stored as fat because we don't want high blood glucose. So when you're storing fat, it means that you've got no energy because the, the glucose is not getting into the cells to fuel your energy. So you're tired. Now, when you're tired, you tend to be a bit more hungry. Yeah. And you're, more hung you're not more hungry for a chicken salad, right? You're more hungry for a donut or something else that's a fast-releasing energy source, which then pushes your glucose up even more. You're still insulin-resistant. And, and then things get worse. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So um, it's, it's a real important aspect to focus on, and so many people have got this disturbed sleep nowadays. Um, high insulin will also cause inflammation in your system and systemic inflammation where your cells are inflamed throughout your body then means that nutrients can't get into your cells properly and waste can't get out. So now we've got a scenario where you're very tired, you're inflamed, and your body has to cope with it somehow. Now, this is not just one day. If you've been doing this for years and years, as we get older, you know, we, we get more promotion in a job, we get more stress, we have a family, and all that kind of life happens. And we don't realise it, but it creeps up on us. Yeah. And we get more and more tired. But, you know, it's just normal. I'm just getting a bit older. When the kids have gone, left home, then I'll be okay, all that kind of stuff. But the, the truth of the matter is, it, it's affecting us on a daily basis. And when we are inflamed like that, over time, your body starts to have to try and cope in different ways. So it will affect your hormones, it will affect things like thyroid, it will affect things like your sex hormones, like your testosterone, estrogen, that kind of stuff. Um, it will affect the way your liver works, and, and all sorts, of, just basically everything about you. So when a patient comes to us and we do a blood test and we see all of these markers all over the place, which we will talk about in a minute actually, because it's really important to understand why blood testing works properly and not to necessarily do it through a doctor. All right. But when we see it and we see all these things that are out, we can then start to see what the consequences are of the lifestyle and then we can start fixing the things that have gone wrong. But generally, it's about getting the lifestyle right. And that's the number one thing you look to, look to is, is lifestyle factors and is sleep deprivation the first thing you look at? Yeah, we're not asking, you know, how's your sleep? And a lot of people will say, oh, I'll sleep fine. I go to bed at, you know, half 11, and I sleep right the way through to 8 o'clock. And you go, okay, good. Ever get up to go to the toilet? Oh, yeah, yeah, Once or twice a night, I go, oh, right. So you're not actually sleeping all the way through. You're disturbed because you're getting up once or twice in the night. And that is sleep deprivation. Listen, I've, I'm 54 this year, right? Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, do you know what? A lot of people don't get there, right? So I'm blessed for it. I'm very grateful. But I had a, a beautiful daughter two years ago. I know what it's like to be sleep deprived <laughs> in the first year, right? And she stepped through from three months. She was amazing. But you still sleep with one, one ear open because you're just listening out. And, um, and it does have the effect and you do see it in your, in your bloods. Yeah. My guest this morning is, is Paul Burgess. Paul is a functional medicine practitioner. Paul, we're talking about things in, in life these days, which uh, in modern life, which are less than ideal for our health. Yes, I mean, we might get a little bit controversial. Oh, go 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 controversial! Um, go controversial! And, uh, I might upset a few people, but, but I, I think 
what I'm seeing, certainly over the last couple of decades, is that the environment is having such a negative impact on us um, that it's become significant now. Right. And we, we see it in, in all our life, but we don't recognise it. So, in other words, for, for example, we've got 5G coming now, which is a, a very powerful um, Wi-Fi um, broadcasting kind of frequency that's, that's, that's we will be all around us, and our cells don't do well with it. You know, it does affect their workings and and the electrical frequency within them. So um, as much as phone companies will show you that there's no danger and all the rest of it, I can pretty much guarantee you the head of a phone network would not like one of those masts in their back garden. Yeah. So, they, you know, and, and we've got it everywhere. We were talking off air then about, you know, if I turn my phone on now and look for Wi-Fi networks, I'll probably see half a dozen. And, and effectively, we're in the middle of a field. Yeah. Right? So when you're in town or when you're in a city, uh, even at home and you turn it on, you'll see, you know, countless amounts of this stuff being sent to you all the time. So, you know, if you want to get esoteric, people are, are now looking for ways to ground themselves and to stop this electronic issue going through their body so much. But we're seeing that. We're seeing... I mean, that, that's the kind of thing that's it's actually quite hard to avoid. I mean, I'm sure you're going to you, come on to some environmental factors which are sometimes under your control, but the electric and magnetic radiation around us is, is quite hard to avoid unless you're going to go and live in a lead box or something. Absolutely, but, you know, there are ways to minimise it, like, you know, turn your Wi-Fi off at night when you're at home, turn the router off and get some grounding done. So that was, yeah. get that electric out of your body and into the ground somehow. Walking around with bare feet on a bit of grass doesn't do you any harm. Yeah. People will feel a lot better for it. Um, but we've also got a lot of issues when we talk about the food that we've got available to us and when we look at the nutrient content of even the whole foods, you know, like vegetables and fruit and all that kind of stuff, the soil's been depleted for many years, so the nutrient content isn't there. But over and above that, the processed foods that people are eating is even worse. So that's right. causing us even more problems. Um, and plastic is just rife. I mean, I know we're trying to get rid of plastic in the plastic bags that we use, but it's still in the packaging. And even the till receipts, there's a lot of studies that show a till receipt, the, the exposure to that for five seconds, so in your fingers for five seconds, will affect your estrogen in your body. So it will increase estrogen. So you'll, you'll absorb some, some of the molecules from it through your yeah. fingers? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that, on a regular basis, is going to mess about with your hormonal profile. Now, if you're just doing your shopping once a week and you, and you touch it for a little while, then it's not a big problem. But if you're on the tills at Tesco... Yeah. or any other supermarket, and you're constantly all day giving till receipts to people, it, it affects you. It's just bizarre. Coffee cups. You know, you go to your local coffee shop, wherever it is, and they give you a paper cup, and they give you a plastic lid. And the heat from the coffee will leach plastics out of the lid and into the coffee. And those plasticides are, again detrimental to your hormones, detrimental to your cell function. And it sounds like everything's doom and gloom and, you know, how are we ever going to live in this world? It's not that the was, case. That was my next question. How, how do yeah. we avoid most of these things? Well, well it's not the case to, to, to do that. But as long as you're aware... Minimize, yeah, as long as you're aware of it, you can minimise it, right? So if you're drinking bottled water, then it should be in a glass bottle, not a plastic one. But as long as you're aware of it and you can reduce some of the exposure that you've got and you can eat better and maybe get a bit more downtime you know the world isn't all about being stressed and achieving everything that the guy next door hasn't achieved it's about actually having a healthy long life that gives you energy keeps your brain function and allows you to you know we're supposed to live to about 120 years old we've got average ages now of like 80 78 80 years old yeah all of these environmental factors are having detrimental effects on us and you know that's taking years off our life and you haven't even talked about things like pollutants in the air from no. exhaust and such like well, presumably that, that has a big effect too. huge right? a, a huge effect and if you i mean if you if you're in the central london if you're in the west end and you're eating outside I, i've done it before you put a plate down and within a few minutes that plate is covered in particles of soot yeah if you're breathing that all day as you're walking around you know it's 
it's going to have a detrimental effect, especially if your underlying health isn't great, so your detoxification of pollutants isn't great, it's going to build up in there, you're going to have a change in, like I keep saying, your hormonal profile, your brain function. There's a huge amount of things that are going to affect us. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom. You know, there are, there are great ways to have lots of energy and um, cognitive function to be optimal and to, for us to live a, a long and healthy life. It's just we miss these things that have crept up on us over the last 30 years because yeah. it's just become part of life and we think, oh, there's no problem to that. There's a great film out at the moment, actually, <clears throat> called uh, Dark Waters, I think it is, um, about a company, DuPont, right. and the chemicals that they used uh, in the 70s, I believe, which are now in all of us around the world, globally. It's in every human being. I mean, is, uh, is this overall situation, again, looking at the environmental aspects first, is this actually getting worse as the decades progress or are we just more aware of it? Or, or have the res- has the research been done to understand it more and the effect on the body is, is now to, to, to a greater depth than it was before? Or is it actually just really is getting worse? No, it's getting worse right. because there's more, there's more things being produced that are causing problems. Like, yeah. We didn't have Wi-Fi 30 years ago. When yeah. me and you were growing up, you know, we had we had a, a can with a sh- bit of string out of it and a can at the other end, and that's how we spoke to our meat, right? <laughs> yeah, but, but I'm thinking, when, when I was a lad, which is, you know, five or six decades ago, yeah. um, then there were steam trains around, for example, and cars used to emit far more visible exhaust than they do now. You, you wouldn't see a car without a trail of blue smoke behind it. So th- those aspects must be aspects that have, that have gone down in some way. How many cars were there 50 years ago? Yeah, certainly a fewer number, a small number. So, you know, never mind the amount of reduction in uh, particle emissions, I get that, but the volume was much, much less. And also, there were far fewer people around 50 years ago. Yeah. You know, we've got 9 billion people in the world now, whereas we had probably six and a half, seven billion 7 billion back then. So the, the cost of us wanting to live is detrimental because we want convenience, we want things now, we want to be able to have that plastic, whatever it is, or we want that you know, fast delivery of something or whatever, you know, there's so much stuff. So there's more of it around now than there there was in the past. Um, And also, when we were kids, what did we do after school? We went out and played. Yeah. We didn't sit inside and sit on a PlayStation or whatever it is they they got nowadays. Turn of the last century, in 1900s, children would play within a six-mile radius of their house. Yeah. Six miles. In the year 2000... That had become 250 metres. Wow. And that includes the people that were still, you know, going six miles away because the majority of kids, unfortunately, are going from their bedroom to their kitchen and back and sitting there watching, playing their games. And there was no exploration of the, the countryside or being out and being in nature. And so that has a great counter effect on pollution. Right when yeah. you're in a in the woods or you're in something that's got a lot of nature and it can um, help detoxify you, and nowadays people aren't doing it. So yeah, it's got worse. Um, but I do take the point of the steam trains and the and the Mark One Escort with the blue <laughs> with the blue smoke coming out the back. Oh, of it. you had one of those as well. Did you? I did indeed. <laughs> My guest this morning is Paul Burgess, a functional medicine practitioner. And Paul, I know that an area that you've done a lot of study in and a bit of a specialist in is, is hormones and the effect of the body. So does that come into this discussion at all? It, it does. And uh, all of our environmental factors will affect our hormone profiles. So, you know, as, as women, if you feel as though there, there's weight issues or you've got some thyroid problems going on, um, some some menstrual issues going on, those, those can be heavily affected by long exposure to environmental issues over, you know, a period of time. Um, we also see a lot of it in males. Oh, I'm going to get a bit controversial now, I think, and people are going to start shouting. So, fortunately, there's only about three people listening to this, so we'll, we'll be all right. But, um, <laughs> that's just, just us three, just outside this window, mate. That, that's, including me and you, right? Uh, go outside <laughs> of the wider world, mate, and there's dozens. Yeah, there's... Um, so, recently, I have seen, um, certainly in the last few years, and, and this is not judgmental, this is just an observation, I have seen a lot of middle-aged male, you know, 40, 50-plus 
coming out as gay. And I have nothing against uh, gays. I've got lots of very good friends who are gay, and, and that's a, it's a great part of our life, and they bring a, a great value to us. But I found it very interesting because we're seeing it more and more. And in actual fact, I was talking to somebody on the way here today who um, is a patient of mine who works in the city, very high-pressure job, and she was saying the same thing, that she sees it a lot. Um, and it's quite unusual. And recently we've, you know, we've seen a particular uh, well-known TV personality come out um, and say the same thing. And it, it has to make me think as to has the environment started affecting our hormones that much that it's changing people's preference of sexuality right because back in you know back in the day as it were there were people who would live a life as a married man and then would come out and say look i always knew there was something wrong always knew something wasn't quite that but you know i, I hid it or I, I suppressed it but nowadays we're hearing them say more that I was really happy married. It was great. I loved my children and, and we had a great time. It's just that now I feel as though things have changed. And when we look at environmental issues, the way it affects estrogen in us is significant. So it will really increase our estrogen, just the plastics and the toxicity in the air and the pollution, things like that. Being slightly overweight will increase your estrogen because fat, produces estrogen as a hormone mm -hmm. um, the lack of ability to remove estrogen from the body so detoxifying it is getting worse so you know it, I don't think it's a massive stretch to turn around and say potentially high estrogenic um, problems are occurring and that is causing people to think differently you won't see it in women so much because estrogen is a female hormone and they'll just have more of it so you won't see that high testosterone coming out. Um, but it was just a very interesting thought and a conversation I was having with somebody earlier today that, you know, potentially the environment is affecting us that much that it's changing our, our gender preference. And that's really serious. Yeah. Is it, do you see that as being people who actually had their gender preference changed, as you, as you said, in middle age? Or is it that they've that, that something's made them more courageous to, to decide to come out on that? Well, it could be a, it could be both. Could be right? both, yeah. Because the reason it's coming at middle age is because the accumulative effect of these um, estrogenic toxins that people are facing, you know, year in year out over ten, twenty, thirty years, is now changing their their structure. Um, it's just an interesting thought. Yeah. Um, you know, I haven't done enough research to say this is a uh, this is something that's. Uh, an actual thing, but I don't think it's a big stretch. This is your own theory at this stage, and yeah. you're looking to to garner evidence to support it. Yeah, I'll, I'll be interesting to 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 look at it in more detail. Paul, one aspect that's interesting is is on blood and markers you find in blood. Yes, oh mate, blood testing is so misunderstood. I cannot tell you, and um, God love them. GPs, you know, <laughs> our, our doctors, um, are under constraints when it comes to uh, the medical practitioner world and, you know, what the government says and all the rest of it. So we do a, a, a ridiculously comprehensive blood test which covers almost every aspect. Um, and it's a very expensive and so it should be, but the, the difference with it is that we use a a range which is much narrower than the doctor's range because the doctor's range is just way too wide now we were talking about estrogen earlier and the range for a woman is 69 to 1300 so if you're wow. if, if, if if you're 70 in the range or 1299 you're in range and there's nothing wrong but somebody at 70 is going to feel very different to 1,000, 1,299, right? Yeah. It's just it's insane. And that goes across a lot of markers. And um, the, the reason is, very, very long time ago, the markers were looked at from a huge uh, cohort of people, and they basically went, right, 95% of people are in the range, 2.5% would be too high, 2.5% would be too, too low. Yeah. And that was it. But these people included sick people, elderly, young, healthy. It just didn't make much sense. 
So I, I'll give you a great example. I had a guy come to us last end of last year, uh, 52 years old, I think he was. Um, and according to the doctor's range, he was perfectly healthy. And I read the report and there was a couple of markers. One's called creatinine and one's called monocytes. And they were both slightly elevated outside of the optimal range, which is the range that we use, but well within the doctor's range. Okay, And there's another one called PSA, which is a prostate antigen, um, which was absolutely perfect, optimal. Right? And but, obviously the, 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 the guidelines you use uh, are specifically for his uh, age and for his height, for example. Correct, yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely. It's very individual. And GPs might be just gen- for the general population. Yeah, and... Um, and again, I don't want to bash GPs. They do a great job. They have very, very little time with their patients and, and then, you know, under a lot of constraints. So we, or certainly I, have a lot more time to spend with people. We spend six months or 12 months with them at a time getting them right. So we, it's a very different business. But um, So the guy comes in and the fact that his uh, creatinine and his monocytes was slightly elevated but within the doctor's range points to me and says, you know, you should really go and get a prostate exam Let's just see, just for housekeeping, what's going on. So he goes to the doctor, he says, look, can I just get this prostate exam? And uh, the doctor said, look, your blood's are perfectly healthy, there's nothing wrong with you, you don't need this exam. And he said, look, while I'm here, can we just get it done? So, yep, fine, all right, let's go. So they do the prostate exam, and the doctor says, oh, actually, mm, that doesn't quite feel right, let's get a scan done. Anyway, long story short, uh, he had a tumour on his uh, prostate and a tumour in his colon, uh, which was cancerous, stage two. So early. The issue is the doctors had told him he's perfectly healthy, there's nothing wrong, you don't even need the examination. And with our bloods and the way we read them and the reports that we have, we saw it very differently. And clearly, you know, I'm going to sit here and say, potentially we've saved that gentleman's life because we got it very early. He's now going through the treatment for it and his success percentage is about 90%. The doctors wouldn't have looked at that probably five years down the line or until it was symptomatic of some description because the PSA, which is the main prostate antigen, was perfect. So, you know, it makes a big difference the type of bloods you do and, and how you read them. So ours are, you know, the, the way we do things are, are, are very different. Um, so that was one thing that I just wanted to mention and, and know that when you do look at your bloods, make sure it's been read properly. The other thing... You, you, you can tell so much, obviously, f- oh, it's f- insane. from the markers in the blood. It's insane what you can tell. Yeah. And the, the the sad thing about it is it's all there in normal blood tests, even if you're in the normal range. You can see things that are either happening or are going to happen, and then you can start avoiding stuff, rather than waiting for the symptoms to come along and it be debilitating. You know, People go to the doctor and they go, I don't feel well. I say, well, I'll do a blood test. They do the blood test. It comes back and it says, yep, you're in range. There's nothing wrong. So the patient says, well, why do I feel like this? And I say, well, we don't really know. Here's some Prozac. (laughs) You know, literally, that's what happens. Yeah. And that's why looking at them properly is so, so important. And then the final thing, I know we're going to run out of time soon because it's uh, six and a half minutes to 12. Indeed. Um, I wanted to talk about social media and how that's affecting us. Yeah, social media is, is uh, I think I mentioned to you before, if, if there's one thing that I wish had never been invented, it would be social media. Yeah, it sadly has created a culture where people are now too bothered about what other people are doing. And we had this sad thing about um, the presenter on TV recently yeah. who took her own life based yeah. on the fact that she was, you know, very depressed and a lot of it came through social media. But n- and, not- of course, that's not an isolated case. The, uh, not at all. I mean, the, the links between social media and, and mental health and depression, and especially in the young, are massive, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. Suicide risks, uh, suicides themselves have gone yeah. up hugely in the last five years. You know, we have, you know, if people are eating grains, it took us 10,000 years to try and evolve to be able to digest them properly if we cook them the right way. Right. Okay, a lot of people eat them and get very bloated of them. We've had, it took 10,000 years. We've had Facebook 10 years. <laughs> like our brain cannot cope with the volume of data that's coming into us on a, on a day-by-day basis. It's not made for it. And so people are swiping this stuff. It's shortening their attention span. It's making them very conscious about things that are not necessarily important, but to them it's the end of the world. You know, we, we are both from a fitness industry... 
and people will put a lot of pictures up and go, you know, they'll take a shot of their abs and say, I woke up like this. No, you didn't. You spent six months dieting for that. Yeah. And you're going to look like that for today and it's not going to be the next week. But people think that's how I should live my life. Or worse, people put up only the best pictures of themselves and the amazing life that they're leading and it's all false because they're not really living that life. That's the life they're portraying. But everybody else reads it and says, well, my life sucks because I'm not having that fun. These people are always having this stuff and they've got all these expensive things and it's all, you know, oh, my, my life's terrible. And that in itself has a problem. Yeah. So, you know, it, again, another factor that affects our health. And that's becoming worse and worse and worse, as you say, as the time goes on. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for being my guest today. It's been fantastic having you on the show. Pleasure. Um, if people want to get in touch with you and see more of your work, and uh, how can they do that? The uh, easiest way is to go to paulburgess.uk. Go to the website. You've got links to all my social media, my podcasts. There's like 135 episodes of podcasts and all sorts of random stuff on there. So, yeah, that'd be the best place, paulburgess.uk. And um, if you want to get in touch, then there's a facility there. Give us an email and, and we'll talk. That's brilliant. Paul, thank you so much. You're listening to Mid-Morning Matters on Marlow FM 97.5.